Hello, I'm Professor Patrick McGorry. Welcome to today's webinar. Before we proceed, as Executive Director of Origin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work around Australia and pay my respects to Elders both past and present. Hi and welcome to today's webinar presented by Origin, the National Centre of Excellence in Youth Mental Health. Today's topic will be on working with young people in the trauma space, including vicarious trauma, self-care and workplace support. I'm your youth, youth convener for today. My name's Bree. I'm a social work and psychology student completing my social work honours this year. I was a summer, or a bleh, summer intern at Origin in 2017. I'm passionate about mental health and I enjoy sharing my insights with the researchers and clinicians here. Today's presenter will be Fritha Melville. She's a clinical psychologist with over 10 years experience. She currently works at Origin Youth Health as a senior clinician in the Helping Young People Early Hype program for borderline personality disorder. As a clinical specialist in the community development program as well, she provides training and consultations to the community sector, as well as having extensive experience working within the trauma space and being a strong advocate for the integration of research, individual, individual and community-based interventions and the importance of staff training, supervision and well-being in order to meet the needs of some of the most diverse and vulnerable people. I'd also like to acknowledge, embrace and respect the diversity in all forms and manner each person brings to our society, community and workplace. So Fritha, can you talk us through a little bit about what this webinar will be today? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bree, for uh, introducing me. <laughs> and I know we've uh, you've been we emailing each other in between lectures, uh, which reminded me a little bit about how we're all uh, very busy and and the need to practice some self care and amongst all that. But uh, today, uh, why we're having this webinar is that working with young people who've experienced trauma uh, and injustice is hard work. Mm. How services and workers uh, understand and respond to these young people is really important. The capacity to provide good and appropriate care and support in an ongoing manner uh, in the trauma space depends really on, on the healthy functioning of, of staff and, and services. So the, the aims therefore of this webinar uh, or the intention of this webinar is to develop an understanding of the impact of working mm -hmm. in the trauma space on workers, to develop an understanding of the specific impacts of vicarious trauma in particular and the context in within the context of broader concepts of workplace stress, mm -hmm. and to advocate for a framework of self-care that's not about specific strategies, uh, but that includes the role of organizational responsibility in maintaining staff well-being in the space. Uh, also, uh, I guess. Um, well, I think we're actually we're going to talk about who this might be for. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So in terms of um, who might be tuning into this webinar right now, it's for any professionals working directly or indirectly in primary care, mental health, human service settings, who work with young people and have experienced trauma and who have experienced trauma and injustice at some point in their lives. And just a little bit about the structure for today, we'll be going over the trauma space and young people, understanding terminology, the impact on workers, support practices, including self and organisational care, and an overall summary and a little bit of a discussion. Uh, just before we go on, um, just want to mention that if listeners aren't familiar with the effects of trauma on young people, um, including the implications of developmental trajectories, um, that they can check out the website for a few more um, resources as well as the fact sheet. Yeah, as well as the fact sheet which is also on the website. So we um, a significant proportion of young people uh, have experienced at least one trauma. Uh, and we also know this is higher there's higher 
people's experiences of trauma among those who work in the helping professions. So it's important to acknowledge that we all come with our own experiences. And this webinar is about vicarious trauma and may trigger distress mm -hmm. uh, in some of the listeners. So um, I really want to encourage that if this happens for you to implement your own self-care um, practice, perhaps have a break from the webinar and, and come back to it and remember to seek support uh, if necessary. Mm -hmm. So this webinar will take uh, a broad conceptualization of trauma, hence the use of the word trauma space. Uh, and um, I guess the reason why you see all these bubbles on your screen is, is, is to talk about there are lots of types and forms of trauma uh, that, that we talk about. Some of us work um, in, some people might work in trauma specific services and will be working directly mm -hmm. with, with uh, young people and working directly with, with trauma. But a lot of people will be working indirectly with trauma. Uh, and they'll be uh, sitting alongside, bearing witness, um, perhaps listening to the trauma narrative alongside um, what's going on. So services who have a mandate to work directly with trauma will often tend to have um, specific policies and practices to support the well-being staff in this space. But the, the rest of the services uh, in more generalised settings have less specific policies. Mm -hmm. But this is, this is a little bit why this, this webinar is important. So that might include people in out-of-home care, working in out-of-home care settings, in the employment sector, uh, generalist mental health services. Mm -hmm. okay. So what we're going to talk about, what, what this webinar is about really is um, secondary traumatization. Mm -hmm. Primary traumatization is the impact of a traumatic incident on, on a particular person, on the obvious victim. And this includes any of those who've been directly affected by the trauma. Uh, Secondary traumatization, which is what we're going to focus on, is when close associates or helpers or workers who suffer from either being eyewitness to the incident or due to their close relationship um, or because they're working with, with the person uh, can have similar stress responses from hearing repetitive stories. So the terminology is often used interchangeably and this can be you know, quite confusing in itself. Oops. So, I think moving on to the next bit. So, really, I think it's quite important that we have a look at some of the terminology that that's being used. But before we go into the terminology, uh, I'd like the listeners to to read some. Of some of the statements I've got on, on the slide. This is really, um, these are real statements by workers I've um, heard over the years. I've been working with uh, different people. So these statements relate very much to a range of terms and de definitions and there's lots of terms and definitions that are really about how people try and capture some of the, the impact that we, we work mm. with. So working directly or indirectly um, in the trauma space is complex. It's complex because those of us in the helping professions, um, we just lost the slide. <laughs> it is complex because those of us in the helping professions want to help. Uh, maybe we might even want to right the wrong. It's complex because the pro it's a process of empathetic engagement uh, and relational engagement and, and tuning in with the young person mm -hmm. and what you're hearing. It's complex because sometimes it can be rewarding. You bear witness to uh, what we call post-traumatic growth and, and that's incredibly rewarding. But it's also emotionally exhausting. It can raise a lot of existential distress for us and sometimes we can even develop uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress in response to the sort of the vicarious experience. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So, while we're not on this slide here, I'm not going to go into detail um, on, on everything that's on this slide. Really what this slide is about is that we were wanting to acknowledge that how we experience and react and manage 
hearing or witnessing uh, the trauma of young people that we work with doesn't occur in a bubble, it's not isolated and depends very much on what else is going on in both our professional and, um, and personal lives. Mm. So we're going to touch on a few of these, these bubbles um, and one of that will be around the vicarious trauma, another one will be compassion fatigue and we'll also have a quick look at burnout and cumulative stress. Mm -hmm. All right. All right, so vicarious and secondary traumatic stress is often used interchangeably. Uh, in uh, The term vicarious trauma really is generally used to refer to workers uh, who are experiencing secondary traumatic stress. Yeah. Yeah. So secondary traumatic stress is defined as the natural consequence or the responses that result from the knowledge about a traumatizing event, hearing mm -hmm. about a traumatizing event um, that another person's experience. Uh, this stress can, res you know, can result because we're wanting to help people and we're working with those people who are suffering. Mm -hmm. The term can be used more broadly uh, and and can be applied to to carers and family in, in, in the broader sector. Here in this webinar, we're focusing on workers. Yeah. Okay. The term is also generally, and we'll talk about this more later, but generally thought of as describing, I guess, subclinical impacts. Um, so looking at some of the impacts, but not necessarily what we would call a clinical pathological disorder. Uh, there is uh, some thinking that a lot of what workers or the vicarious trauma that we can experience can be similar to post-traumatic stress uh, that's experienced by um, someone who's had experienced the event directly. Yeah. Okay. So really what vicarious trauma is about is when your sense of yourself, your sense of relationships with other people, your relationship or your sense of the world is negatively transformed. Yeah. Many of many people in, in, in this sector would might refer to this as as I guess a transformation of inexperience, yeah. That the helper or the work, worker might ex might experience. Sometimes this can be positive, but really we're talking about probably when that's negative. Mm -hmm. Workers um, will describe, and we'll talk about the impacts later. I think. Well, let's yeah, we'll talk about those a little bit later. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next term I wanted to touch on, and this. Term is an old term, compassion fatigue or compassion um, stress is an old term, slightly controversial. But the reason why I touch upon, I'm going to touch upon it is it's still commonly used, yeah. and that's because often terms arise because people are trying to capture how you feel. Okay, so compassion fatigue was a term used by Charles Bigley uh, and essentially describes um, the emotional and physical exhaustion that comes in the helping response. It's um, seen as natural uh, consequence mm -hmm. and it's about feeling often feeling helpless and confused. Uh, it's about that change in our ability to feel empathy uh, and compassion for the young person or the client we're working with. Mm -hmm. And in our work, it's really important to hold on to empathy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next slide. All right. So this, this one's a big one and I think most listeners will have heard of sort of cumulative stress, chronic stress and, and burnout. So burnout was, uh, was a term coined by a psychologist called Herbert Frudenberger uh, in the 1970s and then taken further by Maslach and colleagues and I think maybe a lot of people might have heard of the, the Maslach burnout, burnout inventory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any profession uh, can experience burnout from their work. So burnout um, doesn't necessarily, it's not constrained to those in the helping profession. Anyone in any sector can experience it. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, what we do know is, and burnout tends to be, how we view that is that tends to be the result of chronic cumulative stresses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why it's important and why I'm mentioning it in a, in a webinar on vicarious trauma and, tra and, and traumatic stress is that we know it can be a risk factor 
in how we manage and experience um, trauma and vicarious trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in I guess there's a website that's uh, run by the Living Well website, and they reflect on burnout and they conceptualise that as sometimes being an ethical or a spiritual kind of pain. And they um, give an example on their website when they're talking about workers who work with um, people who've experienced sexual abuse. Essentially what they're saying is that it's not the hearing of the traumatic stories, but it's it's a lot of the other stresses around that. So uh, it might be the additional challenges that might come with um, feeling like the justice system isn't um, treating, you know, working well with these these people or um, despite the workers' dedication and efforts, there are other systemic issues that are getting in the way. Mm -hmm. So that's how we can fit it into how we work with trauma and in the trauma space. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, we've gone through some of the terminology and now we're going to shift a little bit to exploring the impacts. Mm -hmm. okay. So this is just a quote from um, the Compassion Fatigue website um, where a worker, I guess, describes the impact that working within the trauma space can have on them. The expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. So I really like that comment. It's for having worked with trauma that really um, normalises things yeah. for me. I guess uh, the next few slides, uh, so I've done some self-care workshops working in the trauma space and, and all of these pictures um, people have given me consent to use, but these are exper experiential ways uh, that people represent their stress uh, in the workplace and this was done with a colleague of mine called Jennifer O'Brien. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see some of these pictures and really what this is kind of saying is that People are impacted in different ways, but it's really important to be able to have awareness of and connect to the emotions and, and the physical experience that we we have when working in the trauma space. Um, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, so I quite like the picture with the strings, and this was a lady saying, uh, if you can't see it closely, but there's lots of knots in that coloured string, and those knots are sometimes what she feels in her tummy when she hears all the different uh, trauma stories. So each one of those knots are trauma mm -hmm. stories that get knotted up. Um, are you able to click on the picture of the lady? Mm -hmm. So let me have a look. Oh, <laughs> um, it's on the slide. <laughs> But she's physically trying to demonstrate how she feels physically and how she's trying to protect herself. Mm. Yeah. Almost blocking it out. Almost block, you know, feeling it in your tummy and blocking, trying to protect yourself. Mm. Okay. Great. So next, um, we just have a, a poem that was published in a newsletter for those working within the homeless sector in Seattle. It's by Ken Crable. Can you read yeah, that? you want to read that? Thank you. <laughs> this work, exhilarating and exhausting, drives me up a wall and open doors I never imagined, lays bare a wide range of emotions, yet leaves me feeling numb beyond belief, provides tremendous satisfaction and leaves me feeling profoundly helpless, evokes genuine empathy and provokes a fearsome intolerance within me, puts me in touch with deep suffering and points me toward greater wholeness brings me face to face with many poverties and enriches me encounter by encounter, renews my hope and leaves me grasping for faith, enables me to envision a future but with no ability to control it, breaks me apart emotionally and breaks me open spiritually, leaves me wounded and heals me. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed this poem. I'm glad you added it. it to me, really demonstrates the emotional impact that working within this space can have yeah. on workers. Yeah, yeah. I can, I can also just feel that every time a different line comes up, I'm like, yes, yeah. that's me. Oh, yes, that's me. I think what it also shows us is that how how complex it is because you're switching 
from hope to despair to healing to injury it, it's yeah mm -hmm. really sums that up for me yeah okay I think uh, so we're continuing on with the theme of impact of workers and this slide really is what's important is this slide is that it's about context mm -hmm. yeah and context the, the emotional impact that's associated with this work is both natural and normal yeah and that's what the poem is saying and the other pictures are saying the degree of impact can vary between individuals uh, it's a complex array and interaction of both professional and personal factors risk factors and protective factors mm -hmm. that contribute how we experience this so what's stressful for one person won't be stressful mm. for another. You know, you may find yourself listening to lots of trauma stories for a while and you'll you'll be fine and then, you know, a couple of years later or something happens and you'll go, why am I reacting? So it, it's very different. So what this slide is, is, is highlighting and what I want listeners to go away with is... Um, when they start to develop their own thinking and awareness and self-care plans they really need to be aware of the different domains mm -hmm. yeah we're not going to go through all the stresses here but i really want people to look through yeah through the different domains here i guess before you click mm -hmm. on I, I i can give a personal example so uh i think you know my my daughter is is I've listened and worked in different trauma spaces and listened to lots of stories. My, my daughter's going into high school now, or is in high school, and I remember coming out sort of last year out of a, a session with a mother and a daughter, and I felt profoundly impacted. And I was thinking, no, I've been in sessions with parents before and, and families and, and, and young people. And why am I so affected? And I came out and, and thinking about it later, and and really at this point in my life, I'm identifying a little bit more mm. because my daughter's coming into the same age of the, the story. Close to home. So it's a bit close to home. So context changes. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Another really important um, sort of message and theme I want listeners to hold on to is, is really this idea of a continuum, okay, mm -hmm. which links in with, with context. So what's important about this is we need to know where we are on this continuum when things change to know when we need to actually make some change our interventions or our strategies. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, we've alluded to the fact that work can be energising. In that poem he talks about being energised and open but also talks about at times feeling despair and closed, yeah, and that's shifting a little bit along this continuum mm. at times. This is a little bit simplified, but sometimes uh, simple is good. <laughs> oh, there we go. I went too far forward. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, <laughs> so um, when we were going through the slides for this, this was one of the examples that really stood out for me as a social work student. And um, I just found it interesting to see when you can recognise those signs of when you're starting to slip mm. towards burnout. Yeah. So is there any ideas or examples that yeah. you have around that? Yep. Sure, we'll go into that. And I think what's really important to hold, Bree, is that, um, you know, again, on this continuum, a certain degree of impact is normal. It's a healthy, normal yeah. reaction. And you can also grow from this work but you can also become very exhausted and traumatised from this work. Okay, so let's, um, I guess we're shifting, Forward aren't against. we? <laughs> yeah. um, so this, this slide looks heavy, okay? Uh, it's a good question about how do we know what's going on, yeah? And often we're not good at observing when we're feeling stressed or when we're feeling traumatised yeah. uh, and and trying to balance where we shift along that continuum. There are lots of signs uh, and if you look at resources online or in trainings, 
um, different organizations and different academics conceptualize things differently. There's no right or wrong. It's really about how listeners can find what resonates for them. So, uh, you know, the, the Trauma Stewardship website talks about 16 themes and they focus on 16 themes. Uh, other websites will have a sort of table that looks like what we've got on this screen here. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not going to list all the different signs. What's really important is that people go away and go, what am I, what, how do I ra react? Yeah. What, are, what do I feel emotionally or physically? And, and what do I feel emotionally or physically when I'm energized as compared to when I'm burnt out or, you know, mm -hmm. on that continuum? Mm -hmm. I think sometimes people think of that traffic light with your, your red's really bad and, and your orange and your green's are really good. But however you do it, it's got to resonate um, with, with you. And I'd really encourage people to go and find the resources that work for them. Mm -hmm. I think there are two words that are really important for people to keep in mind when they're looking at um, the impact. Yeah. And these are about when there's change going on and if something's prolonged. Yeah. Sometimes if it's acute and or it's it's for a couple of weeks, we can hold on to that stress, mm -hmm. can't we? Or we find ways to cope with it. But if it's going on and on, it, it wears us down. Yeah. Yeah. Also, there might be a dramatic change and you've got to go, wow, why, what's happened there? Okay. So the next slide, um, yeah, this slide, is really a bit of a more subtle reminder. Okay. So again, when people are beginning to, when they go away from this webinar, I want people to start thinking about these points and building it into to their awareness and to mm -hmm. their plan, their self-care plans, yeah. Uh, so, you know, we've talked a little bit about how you remain empath empathetic, yeah, really crucial to this work, but actually there are times when you sit in the room and you go, I just can't, I don't feel like I can get you or you're not doing what I'm asking you to do, yeah. so you lose that empathy. Yeah. Uh, the relationship to self and others, sometimes we become more critical of ourselves or of the world or more cynical angry even yeah, yeah. Uh, changes also because so that empathy into that therapeutic caring relationship and we'll talk a little bit about that later because that's really important um, changes in the sense of ability to cope with the demands so sometimes we can cope with lots mm. and then at other times we're like I cannot I can't deal with this you know that's the old saying of the straw that broke the camel's back yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the, the point there about time and energy for self-care, so how many times, Bree, do you hear someone go, I just don't have the energy to go out for a walk mm -hmm. or I can't be bothered socialising, I'm too tired. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. Definitely, especially at uni at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. These are a few specific points on vicarious trauma. And some of these uh, impacts are very similar to what you might experience when people talk about post-traumatic stress as well, mm -hmm. okay? The intrusions of trauma stories either in, in your sleep or during the day. And I might give a little example of mm -hmm. that in a minute. Being hypervigilant, a bit agitated, sometimes finding yourself just not being present, being a bit dissociated, guilt, fear, avoidance mm -hmm. as well, yeah. So I'll give an example, a personal example. So again, for, you know, I've, I've, I've done, I've listened to work with trauma for, for a while and going all right. And so my daughter and I have this quality time where we, we listen to Harry Potter and at the, you know, the past year, at one point we were listening to the audio books. Now yeah. I don't know if you've ever know about Harry Potter, but seven books of audio books, a little bit traumatic. <laughs> <Take> a while. <laughs> but um, anyway trying to be a good mom, I listen to them. So at one point, and I've, we've read the books, we've listened to them, we've watched the movies. We're The other, about a few months ago, we were listening to one, and I said to my daughter, and, and we we're all calm, it was nice, and I said, mm. you need to stop this scene, I can't I can't listen to this. And and then I was like, well, where did that come from? And she's looking at me going, where did that come from? And it was a scene where the mother studies teacher uh, is being tortured by he who cannot be named. So 
Uh, and I said, I can't listen to that. And what mm -hmm. I realised was as I was linking it back to a story I'd heard from a client maybe six years earlier. Oh, wow. Yeah. And for some reason it had come back in yeah. to my head at that point. Now, I've, I've read this scene. I've watched it in the movies. It came up now. And then I had to go back and think about context. Yeah. What's going on in my life? Something is coming back in context. Where am I on that continuum mm. that I'm listening to this scene that I've seen before and it's suddenly linking it back? Wow, that's yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next slide. Yeah. All right. Whoa, so this is another big <laughs> topic and a big slide and I, I kind of apologise to the listeners because some of these themes are really big and the idea is really to prompt you and to get you to go and do some more reading about it. Mm -hmm. And this slide is a bit of a dense slide but it's really important. So you may want to either pause this and go and do a bit more research or hold on to it and come back to it later and have a little bit more of a look. But essentially what this is about is Unconsciously, as workers, um, go down a bit. Mm -hmm. no, no, sorry, go up. <laughs> oh. um, un unconsciously, as workers, we uh, relate, or we can draw, be drawn into patterns of how we em empathetically re relate with the young mm -hmm. people we're working with, and sometimes, and, and reacting, and sometimes, this can be unhelpful. And if you look at this continuum, you can see, this is another continuum, the under or the involvement, mm -hmm. over-involvement continuum. And there's an ideal range, which are the two sort of green middle columns, and then there's these columns on either side where how we're relating and reacting becomes unhelpful mm -hmm. to the work we're doing. And when I, and it's, and it's natural to slide along this, okay, depending on context depending on uh, the continuum of where we are. And when I find myself, and I use supervision a lot for this, sliding along here and maybe getting into those red zones, that's when I know I need to stop and, and have a think, okay? So there are various languages and models and frameworks around this continuum, uh, and it's often used in the professional boundaries or the therapeutic relationships literature. Sometimes it's referred to as countertransference. Mm -hmm. This this one I've taken um, from a great resource which is produced by the Queensland Program of Assistance to Survivors of Torture and Trauma, mm -hmm. and they've adapted it by work by um, Wilson and Lindy. Okay, but it essentially identifies patterns what we get drawn into. Yeah, that have the risk of having negative work impact. Really common um, to be on this. Yeah, and to be aware of it. Yeah, yeah. So when I've done workshops and at the work, end of the workshop I might say to people, you know, what, what would you take away from this? Some people talk about specific self-care strategies and other people have gone, oh, wow, this is what I need to look at. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just really outlines those signs to people. Yeah, yeah and, and sometimes you want to step in and particularly in trauma and rescue the person. But also, you know, you sometimes go, this is too much. And like that lady in that picture, I want to distance myself. Yeah. I want to pull away. And that that both are very understandable and mm. common reactions, um, particularly if you've had your own history of trauma, you can get pulled in, in, in directions. Yeah. And the extremes of these responses require, you know, some require supervision, sometimes requires personal therapy mm -hmm. as well. Okay. All right, another big topic and theme. <laughs> How are you going? Are you all right? <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, I like this one. It's not talked about too much, yeah. and particularly those who don't work in organisations that have a mandate to work with trauma. This is often a little bit of a neglected area. Mm -hmm. But um, moral distress is a concept originally arising out of the practice of I guess, medicine and ethical compromises. Uh, essentially, it's an acknowledgement that there's significant distress that can arise when there are inconsistencies between the workers' beliefs and their actions. Mm -hmm. yep. um, it's not about a gross violation of professional ethics that requires some sort of management or you're sent to your professional body. It's just about a feeling that we, in some way, are acting against our own ethics. Yep. Yeah. 
So uh, an example, you know, the really obvious example is people work in the asylum seeker space. Mm. Yeah. There are policies they have no, cannot work, change. Yeah. And they probably don't believe in, mm. and yet they've got to do this work. So there's a real ethical tension that can cause a lot of distress. Mm. And often this is around the feeling of powerlessness. There's a really good discussion on the Living Well website, and a lady called Vicky Reynolds has her own website and, and has discussions around this, and I encourage readers to, to do that. And really, you know, she talked, Vicky Reynolds talks about the role of advocacy yeah. in helping us yeah. deal with this. Yeah. That's definitely a big one that they focus on within my social work course. Yes, yeah. yeah. That sort of... Yeah, balancing things out with I values think, um, in order to keep going. Social workers are probably far better at that than psychologists. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah. So, so far we've covered some of the terminology when working within yeah. the trauma space as well as some of the impacts. Um, and I guess a lot of people talk about self-care. I know that term's thrown around a lot mm. in my degree and things like that. But, but what does that really mean when you work mm. within the trauma space? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> Alright. Uh, yeah, I think uh, let's let's go to the next slide. Yeah. I like this uh, slide, and I I took some of these statements from my, the same guy Ken Crable who you yeah. um, did read the poem from. So self care, and I might read these if that's all right. Self care is is not an emergency response plan to be activated when things become overwhelming. Self care is not about acting selfishly, and we're helping professions are notorious at feeling that. Self care is not about doing more or adding more tasks to an already overflowing to do list. Mm -hmm. It's not a formula, and I think I've gone back to saying you've got to find things that resonate with you, you've got to find resources that resonate with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And self-care in the workplace is not an individual responsibility. Yeah. So there's part of me that doesn't like that word self-care. <laughs> yeah. But um it's a good it's an important flag that you need to take care of yourself. But uh, if we go to the next slide, mm -hmm. uh I think it's a shared responsibility. I think, uh, you know, vicarious trauma, burnout and cumulative stress are an ethical and, and occupational health and safety responsibility in an mm. organisation. Yeah. You know? There's a load of literature that show that personal leave, burnout, mental health, mm. ill health increase when we're not taking care of our staff. Okay. Um, that places a social and economic cost on the workplace, if you want to put it in those terms, and it impacts on the quality of care that we provide to very vulnerable young people. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. so a reminder, again, going back to the old, you know, uh, continuum thing, which is about uh, when to intervene, what with, you mm -hmm. know, uh, so where am I on this continuum? What in interventions do I need to put on, put in place or implement? Um, you know, really trying to think of sort of the themes of demands, control and support. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so these are three other themes that I really, if, if you're looking at self-care as an individual or you're looking at care as a team, mm -hmm. Really, these are three areas that every time you think of self-care or team care, you've got to go back to these three principles. Um, so, you know, and what does awareness, balance and connection mean for you as an individual or as a team? How would you, how do you implement specific strategies? Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes you can't change something. Uh, you can't change the workplace. If you're in a really cramped office, you can't necessarily change that. So how do you create some balance and connection and awareness with what you've got? Yeah, yeah, it's within your control. Yeah, yeah. So really awareness is, is about being mindful and reflective. Balance is not just it's balancing the personal and the professional. Uh, it's also about balancing expectations. Yeah. It's about... Uh, 
balancing perhaps how you work, the sort of roles you have in, in the team. Uh, connection is also about connecting to yourself mm -hmm. as well as others in the world. Um, it's about reducing that sense of isolation and disconnection. Uh, sometimes it's about increasing that sense of validation, which you can do as a self-to-self uh, -self relationship uh, or with, with other people, yeah? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, from chatting to some of the cl clinicians um, that have worked within the trauma space, yeah. um, one of them brought up a good example of how to do that, which was they had a, a buddy system that they called on to check in mm. and that was when they they were in an organization didn't really have a set working space and they were traveling and yeah. things like that so they'd often just check in and yeah. see how each other were going yeah. yeah that's a good point because there's a lot of services that work in outreach as outreach mm. workers or they're working in different places and and so you don't have much control over physical space or being physically connected but yeah making the phone call yeah 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 okay so I think that that first point of awareness to me is really important uh, and, and this is why I've got a particular slide on this. So this webinar is not going necessarily into lots of specific strategies. That's really the role for listeners to go out and find those, find the ones that work for them. Yeah. Yeah? And there's lots of great resources. But where awareness is really important. Um, what does awareness mean? Uh, mean to the individual as well or to the team again how would you implement specific strategies that help you be aware yeah yeah so some people are great at doing checklists and they do it regularly a self you know self-awareness checklist or self-care checklist some people aren't good at that and you need someone else to point it out and this is when people say I have a um, someone in my team is my buddy and goes yeah you're a bit grumpy today <laughs> what's going on um, so it's about, and awareness gives you sometimes a sense of control, even if you don't have a lot of control practically, mm -hmm. yeah. because you can monitor and then you can adjust things. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah, so you, you, you talked about that body system, didn't you? And that body system can often be used to, to, to help in awareness. Yeah. Uh, supervisors in workplaces can, work, can do that in a more formal way. Uh, sometimes managers can play a role in, in that. Uh, having a friend is a really good one um, to, to, to use and to pull you up sometimes. Yeah. I certainly have friends that pull me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, um, so I think, you know, when I was thinking about this, I thought I could go down... Um, the line of, you know, offering, you know, showing lots of assessments and lots of assessment mm. tools, but there's lots of that and, and lots of different self-care plans. If you if you Google, you know, it comes up with so many options. Mm. For me personally, I think people have got to find what works for them, which is why I'm intentionally, or we're not intentionally not yep. doing that in here. Um, and, 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 and finding strategies. Now, sometimes people do this in collaboration with, with a supervisor or with a friend or, or as a team. Yeah. Um, and I think you've been doing some chatting with some clinicians prior yeah. to this webinar, haven't you? Yeah. Are there, has there been anything that's struck you in those conversations? Yeah, I think uh, those, I guess the main point was how diverse it was, that it was really dependent on the individual. Yeah. Like some people said it was about just watching funny videos mm -hmm. on YouTube or whatever. Mm -hmm. Others said it was really important for them to get outside. Um, some like mindfulness, but doesn't really work for everyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. this is really dependent on the individual. Yeah, yeah. I you know I have a friend who goes um, is is really finds it really important to watch human rights video uh, films yeah. and documentaries and and finds that empowering. I can't I can't do that. Yeah. yeah. So it is really about the individual. Uh, I have a you know, I know people who, who regularly do a self-care assessment checklist. Mm -hmm. uh, now, sometimes, and other people just find that that's an extra burden and that's homework yeah. and, and they can't can't do that. And so, again, it's finding, finding the balance. Yeah. You know, there are some teams that will stop um, every few months 
and do a reflective space and a bit of a, they might do that, an assessment either through a checklist yeah. or they might just do it in a more reflective space but checking in about where people are at. Mm -hmm. Perhaps then thinking what do we need to do as a team or what do you need to do as an individual. So there, there's lots of ways of, of doing different things. I was thinking of um, one team that's a very generalist team. They worked in a they were a team that worked in a youth centre, but they had very complex clients, young people, and often a lot of the young people had a history of trauma. Uh, in, in that space, there weren't specific policies or procedures that worked that were trauma informed, and they certainly didn't at that point in time have many policies about staff well-being. But this team therefore said, "How, how are we going to? What are we going to do?" And, and every week after their business meeting. They had 15 minutes of a self-care space mm -hmm. that each team member would would facilitate, and that was their just their way of taking on some self-care in a structure that didn't yeah. happen. That. Yeah, mm -hmm. a good way to share different strategies. Share well. it and not go, you know, and yeah, there's ideal practice and good practice, but yeah. 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 So, you know, like we've been talking about this, there's lots of resources uh, and I have to admit there's a little bit of bias in here because some of these are the ones I like. Yeah. Um, but as I've said, like when I've been at the end of workshops, people have taken away different things and, and different things from what I would mm. necessarily advocate for. Um, I think the key message for me, again, is one, how do you incorporate uh, that sense of maintaining awareness, balance and connection in the resources and the tools that mm -hmm. you use? Uh, yeah. Okay. So we're, we're getting there. I think what I wanted to go back to, so I think when I said, I talked about the shared responsibility and so I'm, I'm going to switch back now to workplace support. Mm -hmm. okay. These, the, the next two slides are, are points that are identified in the literature and particularly the trauma literature about what's important working in the trauma space. Mm -hmm. okay. These are points that are best practice points. Uh, but because this webinar is, um, we've intended it to be broad because mm -hmm. we're hoping that listeners may be from a broad range of sectors, we acknowledge that this is not always possible to implement. Yeah. Okay. So what is really important is, again, to think that awareness, balance and connection. The other thing to think about with these is about how do you enhance a sense of control, how do you enhance support, how do you manage demands, okay. Um, so I think we've talked a little, I'm just looking at these points a bit more, you know, there's a responsibility I feel for managers and if this doesn't happen then the team has to think about what can you do, can you advocate, if you can't advocate what can you do as a team. Um, talking about fostering a culture of support and care. You know, that can come from a management level, a team level and an individual level. And that might be through formal processes or informal processes. You know, mm -hmm. when people celebrate birthdays. Yeah. It's really informal sort of process. Or if someone comes out of a particularly difficult session, you might be able to go to another team member. Just can can you walk around the block with me? Yeah. Yeah. Go grab a coffee. Go yeah. grab a coffee. Just just need someone to walk with me. Yeah. Or something like that. Um, and for for management and services to to allow those processes to happen, you know, obviously encouraging things like taking leave a minute to try to finish work on time. <laughs> um, yeah. Another big area is caseloads, mm -hmm. and this is a really tricky one. And, and 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 all the listeners working in the different sectors will be going, "Yes, great, yeah. okay." Um, a slightly cynical, uh, <laughs> they might be rolling their eyes at us now. But I think it's important for me to advocate that because in the trauma literature they do recommend that you have lower caseloads. Mm. It's greater complexity to what you're hearing, possibly how you have to manage things. There tends to be a little bit more emotional dysregulation in these types of clients. Um, you 
might also need time to debrief and yeah. to, to, to ground yourself afterwards. The other way to manage that is sometimes have a balanced, more balanced workload of particularly traumatising story with trauma, more severe trauma stories yeah. with less severe, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, so there are ways to try and work around that, but caseload's really important. It's sometimes not within our control. Mm. Okay. Um, yeah. And I think let's go to the next slide, mm -hmm. if that's all right. Yeah. So I, I guess one point I might, I, I can't, I can't, I, yes, supervision is critical. Mm. I can't un, un, uh, you know, say that strongly enough yeah supervision is not about line management just about line management okay supervision should also be about how you know monitoring that under or over involvement continuum monitoring the well-being of, of, of the worker in the room mm -hmm. talking about the, the the case in a therapeutic way and thinking about strategies because that gives us some sense of, of being effective and how we're working or to think how more effective we could be. It's also about a shared responsibility so you're not sitting with something that's really difficult and really heavy. Mm -hmm. So supervision is so important and if you can't get it, we often say people pay for it <laughs> or to have some peer supervision or put in some reflective spaces. So management could say, well, we, we haven't got the space to do all this supervision, but yeah. we can factor in some reflective space, perhaps. That could be another way mm -hmm. of doing it. Uh, and obviously the training and professional development is really important. This can provide some containment and it increases your knowledge, improves your knowledge, allows you to continue to reflect on how to be effective. Mm -hmm. It can be very containing, yeah. And then the last one about physical space, um, I think this is really important. It's not always possible. Uh, and having worked with humanitarian aid workers, um, where you might be working in a war zone or mm. in a rural part of Africa, you can't always influence your space either. So there's lots of strategies around that if you can't. And there's a, there's a, a man called... Uh, when Toffler, who talked about stability zones, mm -hmm. which you can either set up, you know, set up in your office space or you can carry with you. So I think um, you and I were talking to a clinician who talked about physical space for them wasn't possible. So they each member of the team would wear that crystal. Yeah, yeah. And that was their stability zone that they took. Yeah, with them. yeah. I remember her saying that if she was ever listening to a really heavy story, just holding onto the crystal would really just ground her again. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. So I wanted to go back to vicarious trauma a little bit here. And, and I, you know, if people think about the Harry Potter, my Harry mm -hmm. Potter experience, I think this is a little bit r relates to that because how, how, do I, how do I need to look after myself with each client? Each client's different. Sometimes you're hearing a trauma story directly. Sometimes you're just at the receiving end of a really challenging mm -hmm. behaviour, mm -hmm. which can um, be challenging for you in the room. Yeah. How do you be aware of whether you're taking these stories home, these feelings home? And I obviously, in that Harry Potter scenario, was taking things, something yeah. home. I wasn't aware of it until it was triggered. Mm. Yeah. Um, so it's really important to, to have a think about how do you, how do you manage client stories, and I think there was that story of the the case uh, note. The case notes. Yeah, that was a really good one where the clinician talked about how um, they'd always ensure that they got their case mm -hmm. notes done by the end of the day, so it was almost a closure, mm -hmm. giving you know, ending that exposure and passing it on, whether it's passing it on to the computer or whoever else had to then take it on after that, yeah. but just so that she wouldn't take it home. Yeah, yeah. so that was it, done, mm -hmm. yeah. And I think the other thing that's important around vicarious trauma is sometimes when you're in the room with someone, and you mentioned this before about 
the crystal, holding mm -hmm. on to the crystal, holding on to something. So how in the room when you're hearing very traumatic stories uh, do you remain aware of yourself? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you might um, wriggle your toes in your shoes or uh, imagine, you know, I was speaking to one clinician and they imagine themselves a little bit of a bubble that stories come so far but they can't touch them. Yeah. So they visualise, have a visualisation of a bubble. Someone else had a visualisation of being a Teflon pan where, you, <laughs> where the, your story runs off you. But these are things you've got to think about. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're coming to the end. Uh, this is my little way of trying to finish on something a bit lighter and mm -hmm. the importance of humour everywhere I've worked and sometimes um, even in, in, you know, in emergency departments, for example, where you see a, a lot of trauma and you hear a lot of trauma, humour becomes even more and more important. Yeah. Um, and I guess what I also wanted to just summarise a little bit here is that this work is really complex. Uh, for what we, you know, either working directly or indirectly, mm. and um, and it's challenging. Yeah. Uh, going back, the other point I wanted to raise is that continuum, in all ways, the continuum of where you are in terms of the vicarious trauma, in terms of cumulative stress, mm. in terms of over or under involvement. Okay, and how you be aware of that how you work on balance uh, and, and connection. Mm. The context, again, is important. How, how many times have you and I mentioned context yeah. in this webinar? <laughs> yeah. And going to that question you asked about, well, what do we do with self-care? What do we do? And that multi-pronged approach, mm. you know, self, team, organisation. And just when you're thinking about us, how do you monitor and assess yourself and uh, what interventions, just keeping those ideas of awareness, balance, control, keeping a sense of, no, not control, it was connection. Yeah. <laughs> now I want control. Demands control. Yeah. <laughs> Demands and control and support are really, really important. Yeah. So I guess... For what we want listeners to think about and to stop and think about is what's something that you're going to take away from this webinar? Mm -hmm. you know, I've asked at several point people to stop and go and off and do a bit of research and people may or may not have that time, but I want people to at least pause after this and think about what they're going to take away. Mm -hmm. um, what will you continue to do and what will you do differently? Yeah, I know for me... I'm going into a pretty full-on year of thesis writing, oh, uni coursework, yep. placement, and then I'll be graduating at the end of the year. And I don't really know where I'm going to be working, but if it's in social work, there's a good chance that I'll be working with yep. vulnerable people and young people that have experienced trauma at some point in their yep. life. So I really like the idea that self-care is not just about the individual but also the workplace, but I don't know if that's going to be within my control. So I guess I just... I like the idea of the continuum and ensuring that you, you keep that balance and the awareness of um, when you start to slip towards yeah. the burnout. Yeah. yeah, I think that's something I'm going to take with me for sure yeah. and definitely be trying to work out my own signs and what those mm. are mm. so that if I do feel myself starting to slip, I can implement some strategies. Yeah. 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 So I think that's... That's everything for today. Thank you, Fritha. It's been really, really interesting to listen to and to be a part of. Uh, I hope everyone at home has found it interesting. This is just one of a series of webinars. So if you want to check out some more, just head to the Origin website and there will also be some other resources up there as well. So yeah. thank you. So I think the Origin National Centre of Excellence is going to be producing more yeah. resources on, on trauma and trauma-informed care. So please watch watch this space. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.